towards me. If you ever see them, she said, you must cross yourself and make them disappear. They will steal your voice if you don't. The fear of coming face to face with a Galliganzaro and losing my voice made my heart beat in my throat. My thoughts trembled during the twelve coldest nights of the year leading to Christmas. I placed my hands above the crackling fireplace and reminded myself I live in a safe, warm world. I had to look after my baby sister when my parents were busy or away. When she fell asleep in her cot, her rosy face lost in dreams, sweet and soft as candy floss. I envied her bliss. I couldn't move in the house without seeing their shadows on the living room curtains, without hearing their hooves on the stone kitchen floor, or their high-pitched voices in the creak of the kitchen cupboards opening and closing. They'll be looking for food to eat, I imagined, for belongings to spoil, for pretty tablecloths to piss on. <laughs> That's what I was told. While they amused themselves, I would stay awake all night. I would have nightmares again. I would wake up with a scream stuck in my throat again. Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Virgin Mary, Mother of God, save me and deliver me from these creatures. I repeat over and over, my eyes open wide in the dark. My mother went to town every day that week to buy groceries and make preparations for, for the Christmas table. Alone, I had to face the thought of them with just my hands for protection. My hands which would make the sign of the cross. Forehead, heart, shoulder, shoulder. I counted the hours and minutes my mother was away. When she returned, her plait undone, her skirt creased and her shoes muddy. She said, we should block the chimney with thorns to keep them from entering the house. She burned olive leaves and sprinkled blessed water in all corners of the house. She put a sign of the cross above the doors and windows, added salt to the fire. If there are any still around, they'll disappear after this, she assured me. She then swept the floor and dusted the cabinet with six gold rimmed shot glasses, all neatly lined up on the crochet mat. When my father got back from the fields, with a scowl as dark as his hair, she stopped, served his food, smiled. My father chewed his meat, sucked on the bones, turned to me. You look like you've seen a ghost, he said, while I stood in the doorway watching the dough balls sizzling in the frying pan. Why are you frying those again? He asked my mother. To keep the Galliganzari away. <laughs> You'll lose your mind. And he roared with laughter as he threw syrup steep dough balls up in the air. Here, catch, he said, looking at me and grow up. On the next few days, my mother cooked and baked, cracked walnuts, crushed almonds, mixed flour and butter, rose water and icing sugar. On the day she prepared the mix for the Gora Pedales, my sister wanted to stand on a chair and watch the activity on the kitchen table. She placed her little palms in the bowl of icing sugar toppled it over, made such a cloud of sweet dust everywhere that my mother's face, hair, chest turned ghostly white. She laughed and shook it off. My sister licked her fingers, managed to get down from the chair, sat on the floor and pulled at the hem of my mother's dress. She giggled, said a few words of her own language. It was then that my mother's thumble, I saw it, I saw it, roll on the floor before it came to a stop at my feet. Mum, 
on, I said. What's your thimble doing here? Shall I put it away? When I picked it up, I noticed it was wet inside. Wet with a syrupy fluid. My mother laughed again. I'm using it to measure out small quantities of rose water. Or the tiny cookies I'm baking your sister. The smell of hot oil and butter filled the air. I laughed with her. There was nothing to be afraid of. Absolutely nothing. I wrote my name and the sugar dust spilled on the table, licked my finger. My mother was smiling at me and the world was right. For now. The cold night skies were kind of blue, kind of black. The colours were scratched by sharp, leafless branches of trees silhouetted against the dark. Good night, my mother whispered, and I pretended to be asleep. I knew what was coming. The glass in the cabinet would soon start shaking, and my night voice would ask me, Can you hear them? I'd reply, Yes. The voice would ask, can you see them? I'd say, yes. Then cross yourself, the voice would say, and I'd say, no, a little longer. I want to see them a little longer. And then the small, skinny, black figures would dance hand in hand around my bed, their hooves making a trotting sound. On the night of the discovery, they were holding up a dress made of lace. The wedding dress, which had been worn, was muddy at the edges. They were jumping around, squealing, and a scream started to tear from my throat. My heart was bursting with everything that was happening around me. My mother came in, her hair all loose, in a pitch and pitch black around her face, wavy on her back. And she joined their circle without a word. They undressed her with their black hands. They watched her step into her wedding dress. They buttoned it up at the back, and their tiny hands held hers. I wretch! The sickly sweet taste of the dough balls and the gorabides was travelling up my throat. The night voice was saying, Cross yourself and make them disappear. And my hands trembled. A little longer, I said. A little longer. And I realised that the woman in the soiled wedding dress had been feeding them, taming them, bringing them a little closer, a little closer every night.